so um, so welcome everybody. I, I think um, we're still waiting for uh, additional people to join us, but it's uh, four o'clock and, and we're gonna get going. Um, hopefully others will join us as, as we continue the session. Um, we've got a, a, a very nice agenda today. Um, we'll, we'll have um, our executive officer, Dr. Lisa Kachnik, who's the uh, professor and chair of the Department of Regional Oncology at Columbia University Medical Center, giving us um, an overview of, of, of a message from the executive officer. We then have our invited guest speaker, Dr. Chris Liu, who's associate professor and also the associate director of clinical research at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. And then we'll be discussing various trials and projects that are either ongoing or in development. A couple housekeeping um, items for discussion. Um, we, we have this new uh, question and answer feature, which is on the bottom of your screen. There is a chat feature, but there's also a question and answer feature. So if you have questions, I would add, ask that you um, ask the questions in the Q&A um, feature the other way you can ask a question is raise your hand and you'll go into a queue and then you can actually ask, uh, you can engage um, um, in person with our speaker and we'll, after each session, we'll, we'll open it up for questions um, um, as, as each, each session, each uh, talk finishes. So with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Dr. Kachnik who will give us the message from the executive officer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next slide. So hi, everyone. I'm your executive officer. Uh, what, what is an executive officer? I am your, your liaison uh, really to the executive leadership uh, to, to let you know sort of new opportunities within SWAG for us as a surgical committee group. However, my my day job is as a radiation oncologist, uh, but I, I feel like I have participated with the surgical committee for so long um, that uh, I, I, I can speak some of the language uh, as well. So um, my role as an executive officer is to also facilitate research within our groups that I cover. And I cover the surgical group, the imaging group, and the radiation oncology group, all all committees that really support the disease sites because of the importance of all of our disciplines in, in cancer care. Um, next slide. So what are some of the things we can do? So as of a few months ago, uh, Dr. Blanke, our group chair and executive leadership decided that it was time for our support committees, such as we and the surgical committee to be able to generate concepts and trials on our own. Um, these these uh, trials do need to be supported if they're a disease site or span disease sites by those committees as well. But um, if the priority of these trials are not sort of one, two or three in the disease sites, then we have an opportunity to perform at least one in this, in this sort of trial basis on our own. Dr. Blakey's uh, getting the resources in terms of stats um, and admin at headquarters right now, but it's, it's a great opportunity we've never had. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think you, you'll see some more on the agenda today and on, on past meetings that uh, we have lots of us that are second, our co-investigators on important secondary endpoints on concepts and trials. And especially from, from surgery, um, there's lots of questions that could be asked for secondary endpoints. And we often have to do surgical QA as part of many of our trials. There's also a great opportunity because there's so much data to mine for secondary analyses. And I think I'm so happy that this committee has been participating on some, some really good work together. Uh, I would say that that inform um, potentially either future questions on trials or maybe even some, some standard of care type changes um, by these analyses. One thing that I, I need to keep on reminding is, well, we need new members, we need new junior investigator members, 
but there's also a way when we go back to live meetings, I, I hope very, very hope the next time um, there are travel grants that basically you would just have to contact your chair here or myself and, and we can help make those arrangements for you. Um, as always, there's a whole nother round of Hope Foundation grants and they've actually added a new opportunity. Next slide. So um, up on the left and, and Hope Foundation for folks that are new here today um, is the kind of philanthropic foundation part of SWAG. And I joined SWAG, oh, maybe in 2000. And I have to say, Hope was pretty strong in the fundraising department way back then. And they've just kind of kicked it out of the park uh, since. So they they put in, you know, just for grant opportunities around 3 million per year. So, so these are the ones that are coming up. On the left upper part, you see the SWAG uh, Early Exploration and Development Seed Fund. These applications are due December 1st. You don't need, uh, I don't believe you need a letter of intent. This is a 50K award for preliminary research to hopefully inform a clinical trial, or it could be a secondary endpoint on an existing concept or an existing trial that you need funds to be able to do. You know, it could be a biologic endpoint, it could be a path review or an imaging endpoint, but it's if you need sort of extra dollars that weren't funded on on the trial, this is a mechanism to do it. And over to the right, this is a new one, Encore pilot grants. And you're probably like, what is Encore? So Encore is the NCI's Community Oncology Research Program. It used to be called actually CCOP about six to eight years ago, they just sort of changed the acronym to ENCORE, but it's really to support community uh, oncology research. And it covers the span of survivorship uh, to palliative care, but also cancer control, symptom management and cancer prevention. And so this is a 50K award also due December 1st to really um, foster improved representation of underserved populations in these NCORE type trials. Um, and, and we actually have had quite a few surgeons lead NCORE trials from our committee. So something to think about here for us as well. Now down to the bottom left is the Dr. Charles Coltman Jr. Fellowship. Dr. Coltman, I think was actually the group chair right I think he, the transition happened right after I joined SWAG in about 2000. Um, and a lot of this actually started with him, these, these grants. So uh, when he stepped down from chair, uh, they made a fellowship uh, for him. And, and this is actually a really nice one and you need a letter of intent because it's more dollars. It provides two years of 50K per year towards salary support so that you're protected to do whatever work you propose. And I think there's some great innovative work that can be proposed or submitted for this uh, award. I actually had mentored a few people that have gotten it. Um, and although they were radiation oncologists, the work wasn't necessarily radiation oncology specific. Um, it was agnostic probably to it. Um, a lot of it was imaging and AI before it kind of became Vogue over the last, you know, five to, to eight years. So, so that's a, this is a great one. And again, you know, it's always great if it would inform a hypothesis for a developing trial, but it doesn't have to. And then lastly, the, the sort of most dollar award is the SWAG Hope Foundation Impact Award. This letter of intent also due mid-January, just like the Coltman. But this one gives up to two hundred and fifty thousand um, to up. Oh, all right, hold on. <laughs> Let me just hold on. See, I have one patient, and it's now. <laughs> Can I call you right back? Okay. So uh, this one has up to two fifty k awards funded for a really uh, innovative project that that should support um, and something that would inform a clinical trial. It could even be 
um, sort of the pilot work, which is probably what I see most uh, funded for these things uh, to inform the clinical trial. So um, all of these, I am happy if anyone has any ideas to kind of talk through them and, and navigate with you towards it. Um, there's always uh, th there's always a good chance because I'm on the review team and the N is maybe at the most five to 10 applications for each of these things. So you have a really good chance. And it's a lot grantsmanship in terms of it's always good to have if you're proposing something that's leading to a clinical trial, especially the a letter of support from that disease site from your mentor, et cetera, so forth. So if anyone has any ideas, I'd, I'd love to help with that. Next slide. Ah, so I don't know if folks have noticed this, especially on Twitter, I have. Um, I actually even had gotten emails from other group chairs other than for the other groups other than SWAG, um, uh, very, very interested in, in these data. So Joe Unger, who's been a longtime uh, lead statistician with SWAG based in Seattle, um, has, has actually done quite a few of these types of papers looking at um, SWAG's impact on cancer research. So this was sort of the next one that he's done. And I have to say, it's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, he took 163 phase three trials that span the four adult um, cooperative groups from 1980 through 2019, um, looking at you had to have an experimental treatment with one sort of time dependent outcome. And so he, he found 128 trials that found either a statistically significant improvement in overall survival time or a trend to improved overall survival. And then he mapped these on the US population of people with cancer during these times. And he found that through 2020, these trials, uh, the results gave an additional 14 million years of life to people with cancer in the US. And then uh, he and the, the rest of the team that uh, worked with him uh, proposed that by 2030, that would uh, translate into 23.4 million life years. Um, so, I mean, that that's just astounding to me and just speaks to all the great work that we all do. And this was presented, I think now about a week and a half ago at, at ESMO. Next slide, I think that's it. So um, I can take any questions since I, uh, I don't have to go down quite yet to check on a patient. Thank you, Lisa. And just and the, for the people who just joined us, there's two ways to ask questions. So there's a Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen that you can chat questions into, or if you want to raise your hand, uh, you'll go into a Q&A and you'll be given the opportunity to ask uh, uh, in person or voice in person at least. I, uh, I will. I will put my email right now in the chat box. So if anyone has any ideas, questions, concepts, would like to be a member, I'm happy to help out and 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 take that information. And so more. there's one question I have, uh, Lisa, is okay. the analysis that Joe did, is that open for additional analysis? That database still, is it open for additional analysis? If someone has, for example, a surgery specific um, idea to query that database? I am, you know, again, that's probably what I love most about SWAG. It's super collegial and collaborative. So I think, I mean, I, I don't know the specific answer, <clears throat> but I would imagine that it's yes. Um, but I think, you know, you would just, and this is where my executive officer role is helpful. You can filter sort of questions to leverage data or questions in general to me, and I can be the conduit to, to get the answer. And, and hopefully if it's a research question or sort of a data mining question, move that forward. That's great. All right. Well, we will definitely um, discuss that at our next monthly meeting and, and see if we have ideas that we can in, engage with, with Joe about awesome. uh, possible collabor collaborations. So thank you, Lisa, for the executive officer summary. Um, and I'm very pleased that we have our next speaker, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Liu, Associate Professor and Associate Director for Clinical Research at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Um, he's a uh, uh, a nationally recognized for his expertise in ctDNA. And just as a background, you know we've had several surgeons uh, within our group asking or or proposing ideas utilizing this technology um, either in in determining the role of adjuvant therapy after surgical intervention or uh, as a means of even determining whether um, um, post-op monitoring after surgery. And so because of these questions, you know, we went to the expert and we asked Chris to come here and give us a talk in summary, focused specifically on colon cancer. So Chris, I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Great. Uh, no, welcome, everybody. Wish we could certainly do this in person. It's a lot more fun when you can throw tomatoes at the speaker. Uh, but I appreciate Saeed and Flavio for the kind invitation to talk about ctDNA. Uh, and I'm going to keep this uh, mainly towards early stage colorectal cancers. Certainly ctDNA has its uses in metastatic disease, um, but here we're going to really talk about the minimal residual disease setting. Uh, next slide. Uh, just so you guys know, I don't have any disclosures for this talk. I, I've done some uh, uncompensated consulting for Natera, but no, uh, no conflicts. And so uh, really over the next 15 to 20 minutes, this is what we want to cover, right? Talk about cell-free DNA and circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and of course, discuss the potential applications of this type of technology in colorectal cancer. But of course, whatever we talk about in regards to colorectal cancer would be uh, certainly applicable in other disease types as well. Uh, we'll talk about the currently available data regarding ctDNA and colorectal cancer. And you'll find that a lot of the data that we have in ctDNA are just collections of small patients. And so, we, you know, with this, this story that's building uh, but there isn't this gigantic database uh, that we're looking at right now. And we'll talk about some future directions, including some clinical trials that will hopefully stimulate uh, some clinical trials, um, not only within the GI space, but in other diseases as well. Next slide. All right, so cell-free DNA and ctDNA 101. Next slide. So this is, I gave this talk recently to uh, a bunch of gynecology oncology uh, fellows uh, and this is, of course, something that they're very, very familiar with, and that's regarding cell-free DNA and even fetal DNA, right? So when a pregnant, uh, when, when a patient or a person is pregnant, you can actually detect uh, fetal DNA circulating through the mom's bloodstream. And we know that that's, uh, that's metabolized relatively quickly, but you can capture it with a blood draw and actually sequence the baby's DNA uh, from what's actually kind of fragmented and circulating in the mom's bloodstream. And so in the same way, our patients with cancer have tumor cells that uh, release things into the bloodstream. Sometimes they release whole circulating tumor cells, and we can actually do single cell sequencing on these cells now. They release tumor exosomes, but a decent of what they release, especially when they undergo apoptosis, is cell-free DNA. And these are these fragments of DNA that get released into the bloodstream, which we can then capture and, and take a look at in sequence. Next slide. So, you know, it's important to understand that a majority of the cell-free DNA that exists in our bodies is normal tissue cell-free DNA, uh, but a fraction of that in our patients can be ctDNA, and there's this essentially these fragments of ctDNA that we can then um, uh, sequence, and, and it can tell us two things, right? It can tell us something about the mutational profile of a cancer, but it can certainly tell us about the molecular residual presence of a cancer, especially in a situation where maybe a patient has undergone surgical resection and have clean scans and currently has, you know, what we always consider to be no evidence of at least radiologic disease. Next slide. So there's certainly advantages regarding uh, any type of cell-free DNA. That is that it's a stable analyte and that we can actually do targeted genomic characterization. And so part of that, even in the metastatic setting, is that we're looking for some of the biomarkers that we would typically get from tissue. If tissue is unavailable, we can actually obtain ctDNA to genomically characterize uh, the tumor. We know that there are established biomarkers in cancer that make ctDNA advantageous. Uh, and there's a short half-life and, and uh, there, the data around the half-life of cell-free DNA is uh, you know, kind of all over the place, but it could be hours or days. Uh, it gives you kind of a real-time interrogation of what's actually happening inside of the body. And then of course, there's a potential for non-targeted whole exome and whole genome sequencing simply by obtaining these blood samples. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so certainly DNA certainly has uh, some disadvantages and that is one of, one of the big things is this first bullet point and this is what we kind of worry about the most is that not all tumors really do appear to shed detectable ctDNA and we worry about this predominantly with peritoneal and small lung metastases. So could there be disease 
present that doesn't necessarily shed enough detectable ctDNA that we can uh, uh, observe it. The methodologies for this analysis are really complex and algorithmic. Uh, ctDNA is highly fragmented, and the results can even be affected by the patient's age. And this is this um, situation called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So if anybody in these ctDNA discussions talk about CHIP, it's this idea that as we age, we can actually develop these mutations within our uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs that actually don't have any malignant potential, but they are kind of these benign mutations that develop over time and will show up as mutated DNA. And so part of the analysis has got to be to be able to remove the potential of CHIP to actually influence your results. Next slide. All right, so a couple take home points over the course of this talk, only a fraction of cell-free DNA is circulating tumor DNA, and that circulating tumor DNA may provide a real-time look at what is happening in the body at that time. Next slide. All right, so what about the applications of ctDNA? Uh, again, we're gonna focus predominantly on this concept of minimal residual disease. Next slide. And so this idea of minimal residual disease is actually something that's really, really well established in heme malignancies, something that you know, probably a lot of us on this call aren't super familiar with, but it's this idea that even if you clear out all the kind of you know, visible or detectable uh, tumor cells in, in a blood malignancy, that you can still look for the molecular presence uh, of a disease, even in blood tumors. And so now we're talking about it in terms of solid tumors. So this idea of MRD applications really enabled by high positive predictive value, in other words, low false positives. And this is specifically looking again in our patients in the post-operative period, right? And so we should no longer, we've always talked about colon cancer and other diseases in terms of clinical high risk. How many lymph nodes are involved? What is the differentiation of the tumor? What is the tumor stage? Is, is, is it a T3 or T4 lesion? But when we talk about ctDNA positivity, we should no longer think about risk as much as what we're defining a molecular persistence of disease. And so if we take a patient with stage one, two, or three colorectal cancer and their ctDNA positive after a definitive inter intervention, uh, one should think about not considering them to be stage one, two, or three, but actually be considered to have stage four disease with minimal residual disease setting or stage four MRD. Next slide. So I, I, the kind of seminal initial study of this was presented at ASCO uh, in 2016 by Jeannie T's group, uh, looking at ctDNA in stage two colon cancer. And so there are two main ways of kind of looking for ctDNA, particularly in a minimal residual disease setting. And one is tumor informed testing. And that's what you're seeing when a uh, tumor is removed, you can actually develop a personalized panel looking for the mutations that are present in the tumor in the bloodstream. Another way of doing this is to cast a wide net, which is tumor uninformed testing, where you're just basically looking for the typical mutations that you may see in, in malignancy. Next slide. So what their group was able to show in patients with stage two colon cancer, and these are traditionally patients that do not receive chemotherapy, if you were ctDNA negative postoperatively, this is a one-time blood draw, you had a very, very low recurrence risk uh, or recurrence rate. But if you're ctDNA positive, you had basically a 100% chance of having recurrence within two years. Now, the two take-home messages are how wide these curves are and how they compare to what we consider clinical low risk versus clinical high risk and how much better ctDNA uh, performs. And then the second thing being kind of a consistent theme across all the um, trials that have been done, and that is there are only 14 ctDNA positive patients. So again, you know, a good uh, sample size, um, but um, uh, we're still looking at fairly small numbers. Uh, question from the chat is, uh, when was the one-time post-op blood draw done for the study around four weeks? Next slide. Um, so again, uh, it's really, really rare in any cancer where we develop a test or use a test that has 100% positive predictive value, but that's essentially what this, uh, what this study showed. Next slide. All right, so what are the potential applications of ctDNA uh, in stage three colon cancer? Next slide. So, you know, a, a lot of us um, that deal with GI malignancies understand this, and this is true of not only GI malignancies, but uh, all malignancies together, and that is, we don't really have a great biomarker to tell who really has been cured by surgery, who needs chemotherapy, and who's not going to benefit from chemotherapy. So if you take the example of stage three colon cancer, if you have 10 patients with stage three colon cancer, 
you know, almost half of the patients are cured with surgery alone. So when you give them adjuvant therapy, you're treating them needlessly because they're already not going to benefit because they're already cured. There are about two or three that are going to relapse anyway, despite the use of chemotherapy. So you're using chemotherapy just to delay the recurrence. So out of 10 patients, you're basically treating seven or eight patients needlessly while treating 10 patients to essentially save two. So next slide. So one of the you know, things about ctDNA is that is this the, the type of test that we can use to not only escalate care for patients that need something better than what we're currently offering, but is there an opportunity to also de-escalate care for patients where we're over-treating them uh, with chemotherapy? And that's kind of the theme in terms of the clinical trials that I'm gonna show you in a bit. Next slide. So this is just uh, another example of another, again, kind of smaller cohort study but you can see how powerful this is in stage two and stage three disease where patients that are ctDNA positive postoperatively have basically a hundred percent recurrence rate. And then if you're ctDNA negative, uh, you have uh, a fairly uh, impressive low recurrence rate. Next slide. Uh, a couple of things uh, just in terms of take home points, we know that adjuvant therapy can clear ctDNA. So out of 18 patients, again, small number of patients, about 50% cleared with full Fox chemotherapy. The persistence of ctDNA after chemotherapy is definitely associated with a terrible recurrence risk. And then serial monitoring will increase sensitivity. If you continue to test these patients and they're negative and remain negative, they're gonna do great. If they are negative and turn positive, then they're most likely gonna recur. Next slide. This is a study from ASCO GI uh, in January. Again, another kind of cohort study looking at patients that are ctDNA postoperatively and ctDNA positive postoperatively. The one difference in this study than the other studies that I showed you was that in the ctDNA positive population, not everybody recurred. And so the question posed by the authors was, well, was this the impact of chemotherapy? The key here that I'm kind of showing you what I added to this slide is that association does not equal causation. Four out of the 20 ctDNA positive patients did not recur, but is this an effect of adjuvant chemo? And it is important to understand 15 of the 19 people who received adjuvant chemotherapy still had recurrence despite receiving that adjuvant therapy. Next slide. This is just a take home point showing you that longitudinal or serial ctDNA testing gives you incredible negative predictive value and positive predictive value. So if you serially test these patients, those that are negative and stay negative are really, really going to do well. Next slide. All right, so your take home point, uh, detection of ctDNA postoperatively is an incredibly poor prognostic sign. The specificity is high, but sensitivity in some other studies has been lower, but we know that serial monitoring will increase sensitivity. Next slide. All right, so I'm just gonna wrap up with this. What are some future directions? What are some of the clinical trials that have been designed uh, to really answer a question of, is this test purely prognostic? And I think that that's, it's almost kind of a situation where our technology has actually outpaced uh, our ability to know how to utilize it. So are we simply getting pure prognostic information or can we use this test to inform treatment decision-making? And this is where clinical trials really need to be developed in this space uh, to answer that question. It's, I would be honest with you, it's probably gonna need to be uh, in the cooperative group setting. Next slide. So again, how do we improve the outcomes for the patients that are ctDNA positive? Next slide. This is a great study by Van Morris uh, looking at uh, low risk stage two disease. So this is stage two colon cancer where we typically do not give chemotherapy. In this study, patients are randomized to receive testing or just standard of care observation, so no testing. But in those patients that do receive the test, if they're ctDNA positive, they're gonna receive chemotherapy, which is something they typically would not get. And if they're ctDNA negative, uh, they are uh, assigned to observation, which is the standard of care. Next slide. Uh, this is another example. Uh, this is a, a trial by Aparna Parikh uh, looking at when patients have completed not only their surgery, but also their adjuvant chemotherapy. If those patients are ctDNA negative at the completion of adjuvant therapy, they get active surveillance. If they're ctDNA positive after adjuvant chemotherapy, they have the option to get biomarker-directed therapy. If they're MSI high, they get immunotherapy. If they're BRAF positive, they get BRAF uh, uh, targeted therapy. But if they don't have any of those biomarkers, then they are randomized to receive full fury or active surveillance. Just another way to uh, showing you a trial design uh, in terms of answering a question of whether or not ctDNA 
can be used to direct therapy. Next slide. All right, and then this is a study uh, that um, uh, we designed uh, with uh, Dr. Arvind Asari and myself for stage three colon cancer. Uh, here, uh, to answer the question, can you deescalate in patients that are ctDNA negative? Uh, if they're ctDNA negative postoperatively, they get randomized to either receive standard of care chemotherapy or surveillance with serial ctDNA. If ctDNA is detected either postoperatively or any time during the observation period, uh, you get randomized to standard of care chemotherapy or escalation of chemotherapy with a triplet regimen. Uh, and we're hoping that this study will open uh, at the beginning of 2022. Next slide. Uh, what about oligometastatic disease? This is of particular importance, right, to the surgery teams here. What about our patients that go to metastasectomy? Uh, here you can see that ctDNA, again, it, the, the, the negative predictive value is not quite as good as what you saw with stage two or stage three disease. But uh, when you see the ctDNA positive uh, population, again, those patients are basically relapsing. On the far right chart, you see overall survival. And not surprisingly, if you're ctDNA negative after metastasectomy, uh, you do really, really well. Uh, next slide. All right. So, you know, the question kind of being is ctDNA and colorectal cancer ready for prime time? Um, I would say yes, in terms of identifying actionable alterations in terms of metastatic disease. But what about predicting treatment response? Uh, maybe. Uh, there's some data suggesting that levels of ctDNA, almost like levels of CEA, right, can predict treatment response. Uh, there's some uh, thought that ctDNA can actually monitor therapeutic resistance to targeted agents. Uh, but in terms of the detection of minimal residual disease, the answer is yes. There's no question how powerful this is, but really the question that we're trying to answer are, are the results actionable? Next slide. All right, so this is my last one. Uh, I, th I think, you know, really, uh, when you look at ctDNA, this is clearly the most powerful prognostic tool I think we've ever seen, right? At least in colon cancer, probably all cancers. Um, but, and we know that serial testing will help with sensitivity and specificity. But the question that we're all trying to answer is, are these gonna, results gonna alter clinical practice? You know, these assays, these tests are actually approved for reimbursement. Now, they're not necessarily FDA approved, but they're approved for reimbursement, which means that our patients are actually actively asking for this. But the question is, what do you do with the results? And this is where clinical trials really kind of comes into play. Um, and then the, the main question, honestly, being, you know, will getting this test improve overall survival? Uh, and, and that's still a question that remains to be seen. But I'm hopeful that some of the tests that are in development or even ongoing right now will help answer that question. So I think that's what I have for you guys. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and uh, I think I've seen a couple come through the chat. So uh, Chris, first of all, that was a, an amazing overview. Uh, you took a very complicated topic and, and made it um, something that's understandable even by me. So thank you for a, a very nice talk. Um, John uh, Hingstrom has a question. Um, which assay platform to use inform CTDNA with Signatera type assay or uninformed with institutional um, combining most common mutations? Yeah, you know, um, so the two main platforms that are currently available are Signatera. And as John has mentioned, that's a tumor informed test. And so what they do is they take a blood sample, but they request tissue from the patient as well. And so they develop essentially a, an assay looking for the mutations that are present in the tumor uh, and then looking for them in the bloodstream. And we know that this is a very, very sensitive assay. Uh, Garden Reveal has a minimal residual disease assay uh, taking a different approach where they're kind of casting a wide net looking uh, at DNA methylation, but also, you know, the typical mutations that are existent, right, uh, for colorectal cancer uh, in particular. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the performance of these assays are, are both really, really good. There's obviously no head-to-head -head comparison. Um, I think most of the trials, so it's interesting, right? If you think about stage two colon cancer, they're using a garden assay for our stage three, we're utilizing a Signatera assay. So the answer is you can honestly work with whatever clinical partner uh, that, that wants to work with you. Uh, something to kind of keep in mind, right, uh, is rectal cancer. Because we're giving so much neoadjuvant therapy, you really worry about, well, how much tumor is gonna be left when you surgically resect it? Uh, Signatera would tell you that they have uh, data suggesting that they're able to do uh, what they need to do with even with biopsy specimens. Uh, but you think about rectal cancer being a little bit of a different situation because, you know, around 33% of our patients with rectal cancer may have a complete response to total neoadjuvant therapy. 
Okay, and then I think Gabby had a question and she has her hand raised. Gabby, do you want to, um, can can we give Gabby the ability to, to talk? Um, Dr. Kieran. I, yep. also, I also put it in, in chat, Chris. And my concern is sometimes with, with markers, biomarkers, or uh, in this case, CTDNA, and uh, all patients want it, oncologists are already using it. How do you expect the, um, you know, for the COMET study, stage two colon cancer, the fact that patients may get positive CTDNA and um, and not be, you know, offered chemotherapy. How how do you expect that will affect the outcomes of the study? Yeah, so yeah, I, mean, I think that's a fantastic question, uh, and 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 so I see two kind of main issues, right? Um, the, the way the stage two study is designed is that half the patients are randomized to receive testing and half the patients are assigned to not receive testing, at least, you know, that, uh, that real time testing. And the problem with that, and the patient advocates have really brought this up, and this is why it's so critical to get patient advocates involved early in the, in the study design, is because they were okay with it when the study was being designed, which is about two years ago, and then they all of a sudden became not okay with it when there became uh, reimbursement. So, what my advice is to tell you guys that when you design this, um, to probably not have that type of design because again, the field and, and unfortunately the advertising has moved a, ahead of the science. Um, so I, I do want you guys to be aware of that because that is a pitfall of that study and it's really gonna hinder its ability to enroll. Uh, but I'm gonna actually take a step back and tell you the second thing that I'm really worried about is that the way that stage two uh, trial was designed was to kind of figure out, does testing actually save lives? And so the initial randomization actually makes sense from a medical and scientific standpoint, because we don't know that, right? And so you technically do have to have an arm that you know doesn't necessarily have testing because we don't know what the impact of testing really is. And so I understand why the stage two trial is designed the way it is. I actually agree with it. But the simple fact is, is that uh, these assays have come online so fast and are now being reimbursed that to Gabby's point, it's gonna really hinder your enrollment if you have an arm that doesn't include testing. And that's just the, unfortunately, that's just a fact of life. And then Gabby, have... do, you, do you agree with that? I, I fully do, Chris. And again, that's what I was wondering. Uh, do we have any outcomes in that study that will not be jeopardized by the fact that some patients will be tested uh, and, and offered chemotherapy. Yeah, I, I think my concern is that the observation arm will have a dropout rate uh, where they'll just choose to get uh, testing. Um, the one thing that's really gonna save that study is the fact that Canada is involved. Uh, and so that will actually really help them because uh, that testing is not being reimbursed in Canada right now. We also have one uh, last question. Uh, any trials in rectal cancer are ongoing? Yeah, so there have been a lot of tries at this, uh, and and um, I, I would just say uh, number one, um, yes, there have been uh, a lot of people that have worked on this. I know Stacy Cohen uh, has produced a couple of different trial designs uh, in rectal cancer. Um, I would really encourage um, uh, two things. Number one, would love to see ctDNA directed trials because that's the only way we, we're going to know what to do with these results, and would encourage this group to do it. Uh, number two no matter what trials are being uh, developed, I would highly actually encourage them to include ctDNA as a correlative, uh, a planned correlative. So um, I would uh, test uh, and, and make sure that these samples are collected during trials because you may learn a lot. Um, and then finally, uh, what I would tell you is that um, the more our surgeons get involved with ctDNA discussions up front and maybe even obtaining ctDNA samples preoperatively, which is always going to lie on the surgeons because we're not going to see them as medical oncologists. Uh, I think we're going to learn a lot more. Uh, and so I, you know, I, in terms of trial design, uh, I would highly encourage that too, that and, regardless of tumor type. And, and Chris, from my um, end, one question from, from my end, there's been a lot of interest in our group about the use of ctDNA, particularly in regards to management of colorectal liver metastasis. You know, the, the data on use of adjuvant or even perioperative chemotherapy with colorectal liver metastasis is highly controversial. And, and we see ctDNA as perhaps uh, the game changer in trying to determine who would and would not benefit from a stretch. Like any data on use of ctDNA fo you know, following liver resection to determine use of, of additional systemic therapy? 
Yeah, much like uh, what I showed you, it's, it's predominantly prognostic, right? And, and so it'll tell you, okay, well, this group of patients has an incredibly high risk of recurrence and this group doesn't. Um, I would love to see trials um, developed. Uh, and I know the Canadian group has made a go at this already, uh, but I would love to see trials developed in that perioperative setting uh, where um, CTDNA uh, negatively, uh, negativity may lead to uh, potential observation or CTDNA positivity uh, may either lead to additional adjuvant chemotherapy or even escalation. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's tough uh, because you need a ton of patients and a ton of institutions, and it can be a tough patient uh, group to enroll, but that, that shouldn't scare us. Thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed your talk very much. No, thank you, guys. Any final questions? Okay. No, I was, I was, sorry, I was just going to jump in, Chris. That was wonderful. And I think you're right. I think the question is identifying these barriers that are not allowing us to move these trials forward. And I know that there are certain groups that are doing this, you know, on an individual basis or in small groups. And perhaps that's the way to do it is to get that prelim data and then take it to a body like this to, to overcome those hurdles. Thanks again. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Flavi, do you want to introduce Shisher as the next speaker? Oh, I'd be delighted. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Shisher Maythel. He's a professor of surgery at Emory University, uh, and he's a director of the Liver and Pancreas uh, Center at the Winship uh, Cancer Center. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, his trial. He's representing ECOG, where I believe he's the chair of the GI uh, surgery working group. And this trial is, uh, as you may know, already open. It's EA2197. Uh, it's the opt-in trial looking at perioperative therapy for incidental gallbladder cancer. Welcome, Shisher. Thank you, Flavio, and thank you, Tsai. I uh, appreciate it. I'm sorry, I'm on a computer here in the clinic, and there's no video cameras on these computers, so I apologize. You'll have to and do without my... <laughs> probably better for everyone. Um, so um, is, can anyone forward the slides for me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Who's, do, who's doing that? Who am I talking to? Did you say next Jeremy. slide? Okay, sure. perfect. Yep. Okay, so yeah, this is already open. I think a lot of people on the call already know about this trial, but I'll just spend a few minutes just to go over the rationale, and then I'd be happy to go over the study schema if anyone has any questions about it. So gallbladder cancer, as we know, is rare. 8,500 uh, new cases probably in the United States, more internationally. And in the United States, the majority of these, um, two-thirds or so, are um, incidental gallbladder cancers after cholecystectomy for presumed benign disease and stone disease, and then the pathologists find the cancer. So it comes out to a real phenomenon of one every 150 or 200 or so gallbladders removed for what thinks to be benign disease ends up being a cancer. And as we all know, there's a very poor prognosis uh, with this disease. Next slide, please. So uh, keep clicking away, here. this is an animated slide. But for incidental gallbladder cancer, first we ask ourselves, is it oncologically appropriate enough done just with the gallbladder? If the answer is yes, we're done. If the answer is no, then we move on to re-resection. That's really the standard of care right now. Next slide. And so we know that based on multiple series, including this, uh, multiple series here in the United States from Memorial Sloan Kettering and this series, which is a multi-institutional series from France, you can see that patients who undergo re-resection, which is again, partial apotectomy and lymph node dissection, plus or minus bile resection based on the cystic duct margin, shown in green here, do have improved survival compared to those who do not undergo re-resection shown in blue. Next section, next slide. And as we would expect, the survival is T stage dependent based on extent of disease with T1 doing the best, T2 doing less, and then T3 and T4 down below. Next slide. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and you would expect this as well, but the absolute survivals are also T stage dependent. You can see that the um, median survival much higher in the patients with T2 disease compared to T3, but in either case, re-resection shown in green is associated with improved survival compared to no re-resection. So based on that, next slide, uh, these were the uh, recommendations that we put together in the consensus conference from the HPBA in 2015, where we said patients with incidentally identified T1B, T2, or T3 disease should undergo re-resection unless contraindicated by advanced disease or poor performance status. Now, the reality is if you look at all the large series uh, in the United States particularly, but even across the world for incidental, T1B or T1 disease makes up a very small fraction of incidental diagnosed gallbladder cancer. In our US uh, biliary consortium, it only represented about 10% or less. Uh, with again 90% being T2 or T3. And patients with T1B disease, you know, a little controversial in terms of getting re-resection and their, and their survivals are very good. So something to remember as we go on forward with the trial design. Next slide. 
So if we uh, go beyond uh, in terms of the, you know, the rationale for re-resection, it's because there's potentially residual disease. And if you look at this multi-institutional study led by Tim Pollack, I think it illustrates very well that the incidence of residual disease is not small, anywhere from 50 to almost 80% for patients with T2 and T3 disease. And what is the implication of that residual disease? If we go to the next slide, you can see that uh, patients who have residual tumor in green actually have much less survival compared to those patients who undergo re-resection are found not to have any residual disease at the re-resection. Next slide. And if, in fact, if you look at this uh, study from Memorial, uh, patients who have no residual disease in the top two curves here in blue and gold, even with T2 and T3 disease actually had improved survival compared to those patients with lesser T stage, but did have residual disease. So the implication is that if there is microscopic residual disease left over, uh, that is a, a, a very poor prognostic sign. Next slide. And this really brings home the, the point that patients with residual disease after re-resection, almost half of them had recurrence of disease at one year. So we definitely have to do better than our current paradigm, which is re-resection up front. And then there's adjuvant studies, you know, based on the bill cap and people sometimes use GEMSYS as well. There is data to support adjuvant studies uh, or adjuvant data, but uh, we definitely need to do better. So next slide. So basically a treatment paradigm, we need to rethink our approach. Next slide. And the rationale for neoadjuvant therapy, nothing unique to gallbladder cancer. It's the same rationale for esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, pancreas cancer, rectal cancer. It's basically reduced the incidence of residual disease and this disease specifically, improve resectability, improve patient selection for re-resection, and then ultimately our hope is to improve survival. Next slide. So the specific aim of the EEA 2197 is to determine whether preoperative gem cysts in the treatment arm given prior to re-resection for incidental gallbladder cancer followed by postoperative gem cysts is associated with improved overall survival, which is our primary endpoint, or uh, decreased incidence of residual disease, higher resectability rates, and improved progression-free survival or recurrence-free survival, uh, which are all secondary endpoints compared to our control arm, which is really the standard of care right now, which would be re-resection up front, and again, followed by post-operative gem cysts. Next slide. So this really is the uh, study design. Um, again, patients would be uh, enrolled after a diagnosis of incidental gallbladder cancer, undergo their appropriate screening and pathologic and radiologic review to make sure there is no distant disease. If they're eligible for enrollment, uh, they are randomized then in a two-to-one fashion to the treatment arm of perioperative gem cysts uh, versus the control arm, which is surgery up front. Um, after they undergo either chemotherapy or surgery up front, then they will uh, undergo adjuvant chemotherapy as well. Uh, it's important to note here, we are using gem cysts, not uh, Zalota or capecitabine based on bill cap. That was after multiple iterations and long discussions uh, at the uh, task force and GI steering committee levels and at ECOG. Um, and everyone felt more comfortable using GEMSYS based on the strength of it from the ABCO2, as there was lots of, um, I think the hype of bill cap has kind of weaned a little bit uh, over the years uh, based on the uh, fact that the intent to treat analysis was statistically a negative trial. Uh, the second thing to note is basically they're um, all getting the same duration of chemotherapy, six months in both arm. So really we've, what we've isolated here is the timing of chemotherapy basically a periop versus an adjuvant, very similar to the Alliance uh, Fulfirinox study going on in pancreas cancer. Next slide. Um, again, this is just rehashing a little bit. It is a phase two, three design. I've already gone over the arms. The inclusion criteria, based on what I was alluding to before, is T1 disease is very rare and they do very well. So the steering committee asked us to remove that from this trial and, and, uh, and because they were a little worried about overtreatment of that group. Uh, so it is just a T2, T3 disease. And of course, they cannot have any metastatic or unresectable disease at the time of enrollment. Next slide. Now, this is standard eligibility criteria of 18, ECOG performance status 01. We talked about T2, T3 disease. Uh, they must have undergone the initial cholecystectomy within 12 weeks prior to randomization for this study. So we don't want patients who've been out four or five months and then they show up for their um, you know, re-resection or chemotherapy. Next slide. Um, again, continuing on with that, basically, this is just the nuances of the radiologic evaluation. They cannot have any metastatic or distant disease. 
uh, ascites, peritoneal nodules, liver metastases, lung mets. And then again, uh, from the local, uh, uh, local assessment, you know, soft tissue thickening within or in direct communication with the gallbladder fossa or periportal lymph nodes or involvement of one extrahepatic organ, all things that you would potentially see in an incidentally gallbladder, incidentally diagnosed gallbladder cancer, but all within the confines of the resection bed, those are allowable. But distant lymph nodes like celiac or periaortic, new, new evidence of uh, ascites, things like that, which would be outside the surgical field and what you would consider stage four disease, those would not be eligible for this trial. So these are patients who have uh, um, uh, localized, uh, well, basically no evidence of disease on the scans or just in the gallbladder fossa, which would be amenable to re-resection. Next slide. <clears throat> um, I've already covered the endpoints. Again, primary endpoint is OS. Secondary endpoints are all those things you see there, residual disease, resectability, and uh, PFS. Next slide. So these are some of the key points, um, 162 patients uh, for this trial for the phase two arm. Uh, but if we do get good uh, um, uh, enrollment, the plan is based on interim analysis to move to a phase three design, which would be 186 patients. We're aiming this to improve the median OS of 2.3 years to 3.8 years. I mentioned that this is two to one randomization. And then we're also hoping to reduce the incidence of residual disease with the pre-op chemotherapy approach. Next slide. So here's some of the uh, important points uh, for uh, case report forms. Um, you know, for the case report forms are a little unique is that we have to look at the incidental cholecystectomy as well and the incidental, um, the initial index cholecystectomy pathology forms as well. So physicians and surgeons, I really uh, stress to you as we open this trial, you need to work with the, uh, your clinical research coordinators directly in order to ensure that we get the most accurate data for these because the surgical data, the, um, there's actually specific case report forms for the re-resection as well as the re-resection pathology forms, which is a little bit unique to this trial. So I encourage you all to work with your CRCs uh, directly to help fill those forms out, uh, particularly, like I said, particularly for these index cholecystectomy surgical and path forms and for the re-resection surgical and path forms. And after the re-resection, it's important that we fill out these forms immediately after the procedure to ensure accurate data so we don't have any loss of, uh, you know, something's not recorded in the op note and we just forget. So we don't want that type of bias either. Next form, next slide, next slide. So these are some of the questions we've been getting. So I thought I would share with these over the last uh, you know, six, six months or so. This trial was um, activated in December and really people started uh, in December of 2020. And people have started opening it uh, given we've had a lot of issues again with, with uh, clinical trials uh, offices and institutions coming out of COVID and really try, you know, having issues with FTEs and, and just basically opening trials has been tough, but they are, it is starting to open at multiple places throughout. And so um, some of the questions we've been asked, you know, can patients receive chemotherapy at a local non-participating site? Unfortunately, this is an NCI rule. The answer is no. They have to receive their chemotherapy at an enrolling institution or site. Now, if you have, a, if you're an institution that has a satellite that is part of your clinical trials office and under the same uh, regulatory and same uh, jurisdiction of that, that would be fine. But a referring uh, institution such that did the index call cystectomy that sends the patient to you they cannot get their chemotherapy there. This is a little bit of an issue, I think, with all trials. Uh, this is an issue with this trial as well, as patients get their gallbladder removed in the community and then come to the um, institute, uh, referring the enrolling institution for their re-resection, but they would have to get their chemotherapy at an enrolling site. Uh, another one we've been asked is, can patients receive radiation? If they cannot receive radiation uh, prior to or while receiving therapy on protocol. Of course, based on any clinical trial, we cannot deny a patient of a therapy that a, a physician might think that they need. However, I would uh, stress that for incidentally diagnosed gallbladder cancer after re-resection, the utility of radiation is really not proven and probably not really there. If you look at the incidence of um, microscopic positive margins after a re-resection in all of the series that we've looked at, it's probably five or six percent. And, and most of the recurrences are distant. So for incidentally diagnosed gallbladder cancer, as opposed to per primum, radiation therapy is rarely indicated or necessary. Next slide. Um, people have also asked, can we alter the imaging frequency per our own institutional standards? Unfortunately, the answer again is no, you have to do follow the obtained uh, per protocol time points, which are very standard Q3 months uh, on the trial. And then another one has come up is what about if they have 
adenocarcinoma mixed with sarcomatous features or when mixed with neuroendocrine features or any other, are there other histology types other than pure adenocarcinoma eligible? We talked a lot about this uh, when we were designing this at ECOG and we felt that these are relatively rare. And in order, because we're dealing with such a rare tumor, uh, we uh, uh, all agreed to just enroll all of them. So yes, all these other histology types are um, eligible and they're detailed all out in appendix three of the protocol. Next slide. And then finally, the enrollment tips, uh, I'll end with this, uh, you know, we really need to try and enroll every eligible patient as this is so rare, you know, only 8,000 or so, 60% of them are there and then whatever are going to be eligible for the, uh, for the trial. So please, uh, you know, really push it, please educate the um, intention of the study to improve the treatment, you know, uh, to your referring providers. Uh, really have to work with our uh, CRCs to get accurate data, but I think the best thing would be to educate your local referring providers both medical oncologists, general surgeons about this protocol so they can really um, tell this to their patients that we could hopefully um, improve the care of patients with this disease. Thank you, next slide. I think uh, that's my email. If you have any questions, you can directly email me. I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. So um, go ahead, Fabio. Oh, no, I was going to say, thank you, Shisher, for that. I think there are a few questions in the chat. I don't know, Sai, if you were going to get to those, and then you know we can certainly take questions from the floor as well. So I think Gabby asked, uh, will, will this study collect uh, baseline pre-surgery, post-surgery ctDNA? Can you talk to us about uh, any translational endpoints? Um, are, you, are you going to be looking at ctDNA? So we don't have that in, in this trial. Um, again, it was a funding thing at the point when this was going through. This started about five years ago now, almost, when we started proposing this. So it was not uh, put into there. And then when we talked, when we finally got it through, to, to kind of back off and then go through all of that, we decided not to do that. So, you know, hopefully people will be collecting blood um, and tissue on their own during their own institutional protocols, but there is, that it requires uh, extra funding as, as Lisa was talking about before. Um, and we don't have that right now for this trial. So you're not banking blood at all? other than not, not based on it. Hopefully people will do it. Maybe, maybe we could try to address it later, but as part of the trial, it's not uh, set. Uh, and you sure, have you seen um, what uh, I'm actually really helpful when you kind of brought up those questions that have come up as the trial has opened? Yeah. Um, do you, I mean, I'm just curious also, perhaps this question goes out to our audience as well. I mean, have any, has anybody A, been able to open the, the, the trial at their institution and B, what have been some of the barriers uh, to perhaps opening or even accruing? Yeah, so the barriers to opening have been a lot of the things just from COVID, to be honest, like there's been a lot of, um, a lot of attrition in, in the CTOs across the uh, big institutions, including ours. Uh, there's been restrictions on number of trials that can be opened. Uh, there's been restrictions on number of cooperative group trials that can be opened because the, uh, fund the reimbursement per patient enrolled is not as good as uh, industry funded trials. So I know that in particular at one institution, they've actually put a, a kibosh on cooperative group trials uh, temporarily. Um, you know, we here, we have a, a limitation on number of trials that we can enroll, but my, again, I was very, very, very um, uh, lucky that our CTO, given my role in this trial, they, they put our trial in that, you know, limited number of four trials that we could open and during that time period. So we got it open, but I know that's been an issue at lots of institutions. So I think a lot of it, it's all based on resources and funding has been the uh, issue. We, it has been open, it's open at a lot of places and I'm very, very thankful to all the big institutions that are getting it open. I know HSU got it open, we got it open. I know we're still working in a lot of places. Um, and, and again, one of the biggest, um, like we just, I just saw a patient today that I, we're gonna consent for the trial, but one of the big issues was she lives an hour and 15 minutes away, hour and 20 minutes away, and was wondering if she can get chemotherapy closer to home. So I know we just lost a patient at Cedar sinai for that exact reason. They, they wanted to do the trial, but they didn't wanna to come to Cedars for their chemo. Uh, I've talked to, you know, Peter O'Dwyer, head of ECOG, about that issue. And, and I think the NCI is very well aware of that issue, and that issue exists in all trials. Uh, but uh, right now, there's really no roundabout on that. Yeah, I think that's something that Gabby has another uh, question in the chat about the, the initial uh, operation happening in community centers where the gallbladder cancer is diagnosed. Right. Uh, but, you know, but, but, you know, as you know, those patients do get referred to the big centers. So yeah, so and I think that's the big thing to keep in mind. I think for the um, for our, our colleagues in medical oncology is that this is not the index operation that needs to happen at the place. This is the re-resection. 
Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and the and the chemo. That's that's correct. That's, and that's the chemo. Gabby, that's what yep. Gabby is hinting at is that yep. it's not just surgery, but it's a chemo. And so these, you know, a lot of these referral centers, you know, get referred these patients for the complicated operation, but the patients want to stay closer at home for the systemic therapy. So I think that will be a, a hurdle. But I think if everyone's aggressive about accruing patients, you know, you know, we'll definitely lose patients that just just like the Cedar Sinai patient, but they're Hopefully, over time, you know, uh, there will be enough patients to do the role in the study. Yeah. The key, the key is, you know, the key is I just request all the, you know, the surgeons are extraordinarily influential with their patients when it comes to these types of things. And again, we, we have to advocate for these and all the adjuvant trials that we're doing and the same way the Alliance trial and all of size, you know, pre-op, peri-op, pancreas trials. If the surgeons advocate for it and really, um, you know, try to endorse it, I think we can get patients on. But the key will be trying to get on every single patient we see. Yep. Definitely. Uh, but that that idea, that issue of giving chemotherapy in the community versus at the enrolling institution, that is not unique to this trial. Um, it's 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 a problem with all of our trials. So Shisha, can you comment on the use of GEMSYS in you know really an adjuvant setting? Uh, you you know you commented on how the bill cap is really a negative study, but there's not a lot of data to support GEMSYS in the adjuvant setting. How how did how did that get approved by the <laughs> task yeah, so that's that's a that's a four year story to be honest, and Flavio knows the whole workings of that because he was alongside me the whole time. But uh, you know, when when Bill Cap was I, initially the way I have it right now was what how we wrote it in 2015 um, with periop gemsis, and then Bill Cap reported, and then there was this whole thing. Well, we have to change gemsis to cape. So then for a while it was adjuvant cape and trying to figure out what it was, and then by the time we got to the point of approval for this. The like I said, the the excitement of adjuvant cape really kind of tapered down, and there's lots of people who don't use it, despite it being you know on the ASCO guidelines. Just given the data, um, I mean, the intent to treat analysis technically was a negative trial, although again clinically it was a very big difference. People, I think, there's a lot of uh, inherent bias. People just don't believe that single agent cape cytobine really would do that much, despite the data that we see in Bill Cap. And GEMSYS has been the standard of care for advanced disease based on ABSO2 for over a decade now. And if you think about the rationale of this, we're basically trying to attack micrometastatic, subradiographic, subclinical metastatic disease. So I think based on that and the fact that still, even in right now, uh, even outside of the rationale of that, many medical oncologists use GEMSYS in the adjuvant setting uh, for biliary malignancies, particularly for gallbladder, um, despite the ProDeed study of GEMOX, you know, they still right. say we're going to use so. GEMSYS based on ABCO2 and they don't equate GEMSYS with GEMOX. So despite the, and even if you look at the ProDeed study, again, it was a little bit of a underpowered study. And despite it being a negative um, p-value, if you look at the actual, you know, 18 months versus 30 months um, endpoint, there, there, there's a clinical sign there. Um, and, and if you look at the gallbladder, if you look at the subset analyses, of the protease study, the gallbladder actually had a very good response to GEMOX compared to the other sites. And if you look at the subset analysis in BILCAP, uh, CAPE did not seem to be have much efficacy in the uh, subset analysis in the gallbladder. Now I know the subset analyses are not powered, but that was something that was actually interesting to see is that the GEMPLATIN regimen seems to have a good effect in the gallbladder when you, when you look at the intrapatic distal and um, hilar cholangios. So that's how it all came about. And then again, just from a trial design, we couldn't mix GEMSYS with CAPE, you know, it got very, very complicated. The key is they're all getting the same chemo. They're getting the same duration of chemo. We're just testing the timing of chemo. Right. So the trial design really isolates the pre-op versus post-op question or peri-op, I should say, versus post-op question. Thank you, Shisha. Really appreciate it. Thank Last you. question, Shisha, real quick. Um, I, as you know, I mean, internationally, there's many more of these cases. Is there still, I know logistically that's a nightmare, but any, any efforts yeah. to try to get some uh, at Asian centers or European centers? Yeah, Asian's been a little bit of a challenge. I've been working with Juan Vale uh, in EURTC. Um, after COVID, their funding plummeted too, uh, but Juan was gonna, they were gonna actually gonna try to get this open in parallel uh, through the EURTC. That's been a little bit on a hold, but Juan has been trying to open it um, in Manchester and some of his other um, you know, collaborating institutions through some other mechanism. It's an extraordinarily slow process, but they have the entire protocol, the final protocol with hopes to open it in Europe. Great. Great. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Lichty, who is um, assistant professor of surgery at uh, 
uh, Duke University. Um, he has uh, been working, he, Mike has established a consortium, a national consortium to re-ask the question of, you know, of the use of hepatic artery infusion uh, chemotherapy for patients with unresectable colorectal metastasis. You know, this is kind of the history behind hepatic artery infusion pump and chemo has kind of have uh, gone up and down. And now there's, again, a national momentum where surgeons are really finding um, value in, in utilizing this in, in the hopes of getting patients to resection. Um, and um, Mike has been working with Dr. D'Angelica at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and we're hoping that, uh, that their consortium will, will work with SWAG to try to, to promote this study. So Mike. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mike D'Angelica and I are uh, very grateful for the opportunity to share our trial concept with you today using systemic therapy with and without a pedic arterial infusion for patients with persistently unresectable colorectal liver metastases after first line therapy. Um, the um, items I'd like to address today will include a brief background just to set the stage and review the current landscape for uh, metastatic colorectal cancer. I'll review what HAI is for uh, anyone who may not uh, be familiar with it. We'll go over some of the existing literature to, uh, that supports HAI for this disease. Uh, we'll review um, what, why a trial should be done now and what that trial might look like and then leave time at the end for discussion. So um, nearly 140,000 people in the United States will be diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer every year of which 25% have liver metastases at diagnosis and 50% will ultimately develop liver metastases during their lifetime. These liver mets are uh, the primary cause of disease specific mortality and surgical resection really remains uh, the only possible uh, possibility for cure uh, in about 20% of patients eligible for resection. Now, cure can be achieved in 20% uh, of those patients who do undergo curative intent resection. Um, and for those with liver only or perhaps liver dominant disease, there's a multitude of liver directed therapies, including HAI, which can augment response to systemic therapy, uh, help improve response rates, lead to resection, and ultimately improve outcomes for these patients. This slide demonstrates that 5-FU and even oxaliplatin and arunitecan, the cornerstones of systemic therapy for metastatic colorectal cancer, are really not that old. And with the exception of a few uh, select targeted therapies, uh, therapy is largely unchanged for most of our patients even today. Everyone here is probably familiar with these data, all published in the past two decades, showing that multi-agent chemotherapy with oxaliplatin or arunitecan uh, does improve survival beyond 5-FU alone. Uh, but only on the order of uh, less than six months. And these data are for metastatic colorectal cancer somewhat generically and don't necessarily pertain to patients with liver-only metastatic disease. But I think this slide really highlights the point of ongoing inadequacies of our systemic regimens. Now, beyond first-line therapy, we also all know that efficacy of subsequent-line chemotherapy wanes dramatically. This is a randomized trial comparing uh, second line cytotoxic therapy with and without Avastin. And what you see is that even in the Avastin group, the response rate is 5% and the median survival from the time of initiation of second line chemotherapy is less than one year. Despite these advances, hepatic arterial infusion has been around for quite some time with early publications dating back uh, to the early 1980s. I'm gonna spend some time, again, reviewing what HAI is, and then I'll show you some of the important publications justifying its use. HAI, uh, now given with concurrent systemic therapy, is a therapy that began over 40 years ago and has since been pioneered and optimized by the team at Memorial Sloan Kettering. We all know that hepatic tumors derive their blood supply directly from the hepatic artery, while normal parenchyma receives dual blood supply from the artery as well as the portal vein. HAI exploits this inherent physiology uh, and uh, is relatively sparing to non-tumor bearing liver. And by using FUDR, which has the ideal properties of a short half-life combined with near complete hepatic extraction, we can deliver high dose chemotherapy directly to the liver and therefore to the tumors without additional systemic toxicity. Pumps can be implanted uh, through laparotomy most commonly, but minimally invasive approaches are uh, increasingly utilized. Um, this is a very short video just to highlight some of the technical 
aspects of pump placement uh, using the robotic approach, uh, but these uh, principles apply regardless of, of the technique. To orient you, the liver is at the top of the video. So the lymphatics are cleared from the common hepatic artery, the proper hepatic artery, as well as the gastroduodenal artery. And you can see that these lymphatics are cleared really to decrease the risk of extra hepatic perfusion, not shown as a coker maneuver, as well as a cholecystectomy. So once we establish isolation of the GDA uh, of adequate length, the GDA is ligated distally, we achieve proximal vascular control, we make a small arteriotomy, and then using this vein pick, um, we insert the catheter into the gastroduodenal artery. Once the catheter is appropriately positioned, it's secured in place using a series of non-absorbable ties. And you can see these beads on the catheter decrease the risk of this um, catheter being dislodged. Once it's in place, you're going to see uh, that we bolus the pump with blue dye, which shows bilobar hepatic perfusion, but importantly uh, allows us to rule out non-target extra hepatic perfusion. And using the robotic platform, we can also use ICG in a very similar fashion uh, as a secondary uh, uh, measure. So now on to the data. Um, in the most recent randomized trial for unresectable colorectal liver metastases published 15 years ago in 2006, comparing 5-FU alone versus FUDR alone, neither of which are um, regimens we, we consider using today, um, the response rates you can see improved from 24 to 47%. On the left, hepatic progression-free survival was improved by two and a half months. And on the right, the two-year overall survival was improved from 35% to 51% in patients who received HAI. In this retrospective series of patients refractory to both oxaliplatin and arinotecan-based regimens, these are the uh, so-called chemo-refractory patients, the waterfall plot demonstrates that the response rate to HAI was 33%, disease control was 87%, which translated into a median survival of 20 months from the time of pump placement. Lastly, the most recent pro prospective trial is this single arm study evaluating conversion rates with HAI combined with modern chemotherapy. And in this heavily pretreated population, for which 67% had already seen second or third line chemotherapy, and a high disease burden uh, population, median number of tumors was 13, Response rates were 86% for chemo-naive patients, but 67% for patients who had seen prior therapy. This is the uh, response rate we would hope to achieve with first-line cytotoxic therapy. Now, the survival in the entire cohort was 46 months, and um, there was no difference um, uh, with uh, survival in terms of RAS status. Importantly, 50% of the patients converted to resection, and that conversion to resection translated into a five-year survival of 63%. This is, what, again, what we would hope to achieve in patients who are initially resectable. Now, impressively, 14% of the patients in this study remain without evidence of disease to date. Now, some of these 14% did require additional procedures uh, to clear recurrent disease, but they're all without evidence of disease since that most recent procedure. In this table, you can see a somewhat crude comparison of HAI versus systemic therapy for this disease. And while molecular characteristics such as RAS status may uh, impact these numbers, I think these are general outcomes. Importantly, what you can see in the patients that are previously treated highlighted by the red arrows, and that's the exact population of patients we're, we're hoping to do a trial for, HAI appears to be associated with an improved response rate, survival, and conversion to resection. This is a case that highlights the utility of HAI for appropriately selected patients. This is a 55-year-old who developed metachronous disease 10 years after resection and adjuvant therapy for uh, sigmoid cancer. Um, once her liver disease was detected, she was initiated on full fury and EGFR inhibitor. And after um, six cycles or three months of that, the scans on the left demonstrate that she still has a very large centrally located tumor involving all three hepatic veins, and um, this was deemed technically unresectable. So she underwent robotic pump placement, and after three months of FEBR combined with full fury, you can see on the right significant regression of this tumor, but importantly, the tumor pulled away from the right hepatic vein, and um, she underwent margin negative resection two months ago. So why is the trial justified now? Well, first, the most recent clinical trial, randomized trial was uh, performed over 15 years ago and compared what are now outdated pump and systemic regimens. 
Also, due to the majority of the data coming from a single institution and the ongoing skepticism regarding safety, efficacy, and feasibility, HAI has not been widely accepted in the community, and therefore it's not available to most of our patients. Additionally, we do not have prospective data comparing HAI to modern systemic regimens. We believe that we are in a window of opportunity. There are now enough centers using HAI to conduct a real-world pragmatic multi-center trial, and with the ongoing lack of effective second-line therapies, we ought to answer this question before equipoise is lost. Our goal is to therefore prove that HAI plays a meaningful role in standardized algorithms uh, to treat colorectal liver metastases and answer the question of when HAI should be used and for what benefit. So this is our proposed uh, trial schema. On the left is patient eligibility, which includes adults with persistently and technically unresectable colorectal liver metastases who have seen at least six, but no more than 12 cycles of first-line chemotherapy. This is somewhat of a sweet spot. We're also going to include patients um, who recur in the liver within 12 months of completing adjuvant therapy for their high-risk stage two or stage three cancers. These are the adjuvant failures. And we'll also allow patients with low volume lung disease, since that's how most people using HAI um, um, use it. After central review and randomization, patients will um, either receive HAI combined with double chemotherapy versus institutional standard. And at each response assessment, patients in the chemotherapy only arm could become eligible for crossover into the pump arm if they have liver only progression. The primary endpoint is overall survival. You can see secondary endpoints shown here. And then we also intend to include some correlatives to help us improve patient selection and identify which patients might be at risk for short versus long-term complications. These are the statistical considerations uh, and the statistician that helped with these numbers is the same statistician that worked with Dr. Kemeny 15 years ago for the CALGB trial that I showed you uh, early on. With a power of 0.85, a hazard ratio of 0.67, which detects a difference of uh, 24 months survival for chemo, versus 36 months with the HAI uh, group. Uh, we need a three-year accrual, a total study length of six years, and 309 patients to power the study. We intend to report the secondary endpoints at the end of accrual, and I'd also like to highlight that no single center can enroll more than 40% of patients into either arm, which is a major critique of um, previous um, literature. Mike D'Angelica and I co-lead uh, an international HII consortium consisting now of the 47 centers um, shown on this slide, and we're committed to designing and implementing multi-center randomized HII trials. In doing so, we aim to improve HII outcomes, identify which patients will derive the greatest benefit from HII, and also determine where HII should be used in standardized approaches to patients with colorectal liver metastases. I want to briefly review some of the points of uh, discussion or frequently asked questions uh, that we've encountered over the past several months of designing this uh, and then open things up for discussion. Uh, so one is the issue of crossover. Um, some have challenged us that uh, given our primary endpoint is overall survival, allowing crossover may um, blur that outcome. Uh, but with a therapy that has a response rate of at least 30%, even in heavily pretreated and even chemo refractory patients, none of us feel that we can ethically withhold this therapy for patients in the chemotherapy arm. The sample size may seem high, uh, but there are 17 centers currently implanting at least 10 to 20 pumps per year, and that number continues to grow. And lastly is feasibility. Um, the HII consortium uh, now consists of over 100 surgeons and importantly medical oncologists, all of whom have been involved in the um, trial concept and design that I proposed to you today. Um, we also have support from the HPBA, and importantly, we've spoken with um, three different patient advocates, including two from the task force, and all of the patient advocates are supportive of the trial, uh, believe the concept is fair, and would accrue well. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mike, for uh, a very nice summary and, and uh, uh, overview of the study. Um, Gabby has a question, a, a very important question, actually. Patient selectivity plays a huge role in benefit from HAI. How will this be ensured? Not all technically unresectable liver mets are suitable for HAI. In addition, um, she quotes the literature in terms of the median overall survival for standard of care is closer to 30 to 33 months instead of 24 months if, they, if you use all lines of therapy. And improving overall survival from 24 to 36 may not be realistic. 
Can you um, comment on those questions? Sure, I think those are great questions uh, and thank you for them. Um, you know, patient selection is really important. Um, one aspect of this is getting patients earlier in the disease course, which is when we um, really prefer to use HII. Um, this is uh, a period of time where, you know, livers should still be healthy enough uh, to, to receive FUDR. Um, the patients also have to be fit enough to undergo major surgery, and these are the ECOG zero to one patients only. Um, they cannot have underlying liver disease. They cannot have portal hypertension. Um, and we're really limiting the, um, the amount of extra pack disease to, to next to nothing, really just the lung metastases uh, that we know behave quite indolently compared to other sites. Um, uh, we also will have, you know, ideally central review so that, um, you know, there's somewhat co some consistency uh, amongst centers. The question of median survival is a really great question, and this is something we've discussed amongst the consortium multiple times. I think if you take the patients who are um, KRAS mutated, their survival is closer to 20 to 24 months, whereas those with wild type cancers are, you know, 30 to maybe 32 or 33 months, as you suggested. So um, when you take the average here of all those patients, uh, we thought a 24 month survival uh, was fair, um, especially with, when you include the, the KRAS mutated patients. I, I hope that answers your question. Mike, can I add two quick things? Sure. Uh, tumor bulk is an important in selection. Uh, so patients with huge tumor bulks beyond 70-80% of the liver will be excluded. That's the main selection. We're not as selective as most people think we are, uh, performance status aside. And also the median survival is not being measured from time zero. It's being measured uh, after exposure to systemic therapy and persistently unresectable. Thank you, Mike. Well, I think there was probably one other thing uh, that maybe uh, a little different in this group is also the, the amenable vascular anatomy. So that's going to probably be a smaller group, but that is a consideration. We always say it, it's exceedingly uncommon. There was uh, just for the, for the group, uh, Mike um, Litsky or Mike D'Angelico, if you could educate us on um, uh, the use of HAI if patients have had regional therapy. I know we had some email exchanges about that. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I would say that historically and in general, we prefer not to use HAI after other um, transarterial therapies, specifically Y90 or any uh, other um, particle embolization that could obscure hepatic delivery, hepatic artery delivery of FUDR. Now Y90 has the added component of ongoing liver toxicity uh, beyond the disruption of the arterial vasculature. And for patients that have very selective uh, radioembolization, such as segmental Y90, then HAI is probably safe in those patients afterward. Um, but um, for people that have low bar radioembolization, uh, I think the risk is too high. Now, specifically to this trial, so that's in practicality, specific to this trial, we will not um, include patients that have had prior transarterial therapies. That includes radioembolization taste, bland embo, or anything else that you can imagine. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Flavi, you want to introduce the next speaker? Yep. Pull up our, we have the slides up. Just pull the agenda. Great. Um, great. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. John Dosky. He's coming to us from the Children's uh, Oncology Group uh, sur uh, Surgery. Uh, he's a professor of surgery at UT San Antonio. And talking to us about phase three randomized trial comparing open and thoracoscopic management of pulmonary metastasis in patients with osteosarcoma. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, and thank you both uh, for the invitation. Um, I come seeking help. Uh, I will say that right up front, uh, even before the disclosures. Um, I, we are in the process of getting a study together. We had presented to this uh, organization about 18 months ago. Um, as we continue on, uh, we should be looking to open this study in the course of the next four to five months or so. Uh, so definitely looking to generate interest. Next slide. Again, no disclosures except I come begging for help. Next slide. 
Um, so at the, with this presentation, I hope to be able to show you some of the research questions of the study. Um, I think some of the people on will be particularly interested because a major component is the biology aspects, including ctDNA. Um, I hope to be able to identify patients eligible for this study, um, and then I hope to go ahead and have you consider uh, opening this protocol at your institution, uh, understanding the, the relatively straightforward uh, uh, randomized surgical trial. Next slide. Um, at its core, uh, we are looking uh, for a study randomizing surgical management of oligometastatic lesions, uh, pulmonary metastatic uh, to open orthoarcoscopic surgery, uh, specifically limited disease. We're trying to, in the setting of a significantly heterogeneous, heterogeneous disease process, uh, try and, and get as much consistency as we can. Uh, we do have significant involvement of the surgery discipline, uh, imaging discipline, biology, and the quality of life, uh, and you'll be seeing that through the study and the different objectives. Next slide. Uh, eligibility is uh, less than 50 years of age, control of primary disease, pulmonary only metastatic osteosarcoma, and four or fewer lesions per hemithorax. At least one of the lesions needs to be three millimeter or greater, uh, cannot be larger than three centimeter, needs to be peripheral in location, appearance consistent with metastasis, uh, no central lesions, needs to be amenable to wedge resection or segmentectomy, uh, no anatomic resections, nor blurry pleural margins. Um, the primary, uh, <laughs> if, if I'm going too slow, you can move ahead. <laughs> um, the, uh, there it will be real-time uh, preoperative central radiologic review to confirm eligibility. Institutional localization efforts will be permitted and data collected. Uh, the randomization will occur to open or VAT surgery within 28 days of the imaging. Uh, there will be quality of life studies obtained pre-op, post-op at 48 hours, seven to 10 days, and four to six weeks. The first post-operative chest CT will be at eight to 12 weeks. We will be collecting preoperative uh, blood samples for uh, circulating uh, tumor DNA, uh, as well as circulating tumor cells that will be pre-op um, at 48 hours uh, and that uh, four to six weeks. Next slide. Uh, the primary objective is to determine if open surgical resection is superior to thoracoscopic resection for thoracic event-free survival uh, in these patients. Um, secondary objectives, there are three. Uh, the first is to determine if open is superior to thoracos thoracoscopy for event-free survival, meaning metastases to other sites, uh, to determine if open surgical resection is superior to thoracoscopy for overall survival. Uh, and, th and the third was going to be a, a quality of life issue uh, that would be addressing uh, superiority of thoracoscopy. Uh, next slide. Um, with this, the, the, uh, the uh, exploratory aims uh, include 30-day post-operative complications, uh, patterns of recurrence, which is really uh, quite interesting in metastatic osteosarcoma, uh, describe localization techniques, um, and then we are going to be describing the relationship between the preoperative uh, chest CT, intraoperative findings, pathologic findings, comparing those preoperative radiologic features to the presence of viable tumor. Next slide. Uh, the biology and quality of life exploratory aims, we are going to be uh, looking to see if circulating tumor cells can be detected and isolated from blood samples uh, pre and post-op. We are going to be looking for detectable levels of circulating tumor DNA uh, pre-op and post-op. We're going to be collecting and banking pulmonary metastatic lesions, paired lesions, uh, perioperative and uh, peripheral blood samples uh, at diagnosis and throughout. Uh, as I had said, it's going to be at uh, 48 hours post-op, uh, six, four to six weeks post-op, um, and then depending on the willingness, uh, about every three months thereafter with the first two years of CT scans. Uh, we are also going to be looking uh, uh, to compare treatment arms in the relationship between surgical approach and patient reported outcomes, uh, specifically functional impairment of the upper extremity, pain intensity, uh, and health-related uh, quality of life using a PROMISE scale. Next slide. Uh, localization options, uh, you see them all listed. All of them are, are, are applicable. Uh, it was pointed out to me, the second to last uh, item uh, was pointed out by an ECOG surgeon that he uses his finger for localization uh, with thoracoscopic. So we go ahead and have that as a CRF as well. 
Next slide. Uh, the imaging aspects, fewer, four fewer lesions, uh, one, at least one greater than or equal to three, none greater than three centimeter, uh, considered resectable, features consistent with uh, size and shape, density, presence of calcification, sharp margins. Uh, we're going to be going on either consistent with or suspicious for as a greater than 90 or greater than 75% subjective certainty. Uh, as I said, there will be real-time uh, central radiologic review to confirm the eligibility. Uh, the initial post-operative CT scan will be performed at 8 to 12 weeks, will be collected for central review, uh, but will not have any real-time um, feedback. Uh, chest CT will then be performed every three months for the first two years uh, and thereafter per institutional um, protocol. Uh, Short-term interval follow-up can be addressed for indeterminate or lesions below three uh, millimeter size. Uh, thoracic event uh, will be diagnosed and determined uh, by the local institution. Next slide. Uh, the biology and, and quality of life aspects, uh, we are going to be taking resected specimens fresh to pathology in a sterile container. Uh, blood will be collected pre-op and post-op. Local institutional uh, anatomic pathology will determine margins, uh, certainly a gross assessment with a microscopic assessment encouraged. Uh, we, are going, we are discouraging decalcification only if necessary, uh, but to secure tissue prior, uh, fresh specifically for the... Uh, for the, uh, the collection of, of the DNA. Uh, the quality of life aspects, we're gonna be using promise measures for the kids, promise 25 for the adults, promise 29 plus two. There is an addition, additionally an upper extremity functional um, survey. Uh, we're hoping to go ahead and have that done by smartphone. Uh, we're hoping to have a single point for pain at uh, between 24 and 72 hours. Uh, we will be collecting pain med data. Uh, we're going to be looking for a few more questions at the seven to 14 days post-op and then at the four to six weeks post-op. Next. Um, so in conclusion, um, the eligibility criteria um, are in some ways fairly flexible, in some ways fairly rigid related to trying to flatten some of the heterogeneity. Um, the, the research aims uh, are certainly um, appropriate. Um, and what, what I'm hoping for is clinical equipoise. When I presented this to the adult studies, um, it is rare that an adult surgeon does not have a decided fixed opinion about what is the right answer here. Um, and within a single group, it can be open, it can be thoracoscopic with significant disagreement between. Um, I'm hoping to get NCT and uh, organizations uh, to open at institutions uh, so that we can hopefully enroll and complete this study. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So um, I guess the, the question I, I had was, what, how, what's this, I, I'm, this is out of my expertise, so what is the standard of care nationally right now, open or thoroscopic? <laughs> Depends on what institution you're at. Um, and so you go to the literature, you'll find um, if you open it up and you're looking at Memorial Sloan Kettering, it's open. It's contralateral exploration for unilateral disease. Uh, you go to a place like St. Jude, they're going to be advocating for thoracoscopy for a limited disease. Uh, you go to Boston, they may have challenges with localization techniques and as a result, uh, bias it towards open. Uh, there's all different ways um, that people get to that conclusion. Some of it is how they're trained. Some of it is at the institution they're in. There is, as we sit here, uh, no standard accepted oncologic way to do it, I would suggest. And if, if I if may ask, um, how can SWAG and the SWAG Surgical Committee help you uh, with this concept? Take a look at the study um, and see if it's a, a study that you're willing to, to participate in. Uh, when we went to the Pediatric Surgery Association, uh, we asked them, would they be willing to participate? And this is in the setting of some pretty fixed ideas on how they would surgically approach it. Um, and they said that they would be willing to participate in a randomized control trial to answer the question. Uh, and if thoracotomy truly is the superior oncologic way in thoracic event-free survival, 
um, then that's going to be an important piece of information that, that we need to respect. Um, so the ask would be uh, to take a look at it and to consider opening at your institution. Uh, if there are questions with it, um, I'd be happy to try and answer. If there's certain other aspects that uh, we can add to it or, or remove from it um, to, to ameliorate some of the, the challenges. Um, but the clinical equipoise is the trickiest part. We've also gone to the, uh, to the um, osteosarcoma organizations and, and with patient meetings uh, talking about this specific study with about a 65 to 70 percent audience um, approval and a willingness to participate on it. Um, so both of them are, are used um, and both of them are suggested as uh, the appropriate oncologic measure. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Sorry, sorry, can I, this is Shisha. Can I ask uh, two questions real quick? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so, John, thank you very much. I'm actually at Emory. So I work very closely with Ken Cardona. So I've watched the evolution of this trial from its inception over the last few months. And, and I appreciate your persistence with it, trying to get this through. I think that's great. One, uh, two questions about the study. Uh, in terms of your primary outcome, you said the primary outcome was event-free survival. Thoracic event-free survival. Yeah, thoracic. So is that ipsilateral or ipsilateral? Anything in the lung. lung? Yep, this is anything in lung. And that gets to the Memorial okay. Sloan Kettering bias to explore the opposite side with unilateral right. disease that but you're I'm just so missing it. So even if you have a left-sided operation, they have a recurrence in the right, that's going to be an event? Yes. So that, that would be regardless of open or thoracoscopic approach. So Correct. That's, I have to think about that a little bit in terms of how that really aims, looks at your question of thoracoscopic versus open. Um, the second question I had, in terms of the funding for all your correlative studies, CTDNA, radiologic review, blood, where, where have, because this is going through COG, correct? So you're trying to go yes. through the NCTN. Correct. So how, have you got that funded through like osteosarcoma foundations or where exactly are you the osteosarcoma osteosarcoma foundation and the quad uh, quad W yes quad W okay and then not to be the dead horse but you know the um, we, we were trying I got approached to try to find an ECOG champion for you uh, for this study and so I went to the thoracic surgeons who uh, who are participating in ECOG and we struggled because to, to your point. Um, they feel there's, there's such a, a bias and they feel like that's crazy. They're doing it that way. And that's crazy doing it the other way. Uh, I don't know. I think that's a, as you mentioned, that's a really, really big problem with this trial because of the bias that exists. And particularly because you have the AYH, you know, the adolescent, adolescent and youth population in this. Um, a lot of people have that bias of, you know, you would think they have a bias of VATS, but there's just as many people who have a bias of open for the kids as well. Yes. Um, and, and the parents of the kids would yes. initially were, were, no, we want everything done. We want it full aggressive, full yes, on. Exactly. Um, and so they were initially open. Yeah. So well, I, 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 I struggle here because we're a short of time here. Yeah, sorry. I'm just saying I struggle yeah. finding a champion for you. So thank we're, we're going to keep trying. Thank you, John. Well, thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Jeremy Harris, uh, who uh, comes to us from the University of California, Irvine, who's going to talk to us about short course versus long course radiation for resectable high grade soft tissue sarcoma of the extremity. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. So uh, I'm a radiation oncologist at University of California at Irvine. And I'd really appreciate everybody's input today and kind of shifting gears because this is an extremity sarcoma study concept. And for decades, it's actually been thought that there may be some benefit to using short courses of radiation for sarcoma. Um, I think we already heard a little bit about this with regards to rectal cancer today or alluding to it. And the data are more sparse for sarcoma. These are heterogeneous tumors, but in general, the model, the mathematical model behind radiation dosing seems to support um, this model for short course. And in fact, there are now a number of studies that have been completed um, using short course radiation in the operative setting. These top three I'm highlighting utilize a higher dose equivalent, roughly speaking to 50 gray or more. Failure rates were zero to 8%. It comes at a cost of higher wound complication rates of 31% or higher. And then in contrast, trials that have used lower doses of 35 to 37.5 gray, again, in equivalent um, terminology, 
have failure rates of 7 to 19 percent, uh, but generally lower wound complication rates. There are also a number of single arm studies that are ongoing. And so I would really like to do a multi-institutional randomized study of short course versus long course radiation for resectable high-grade soft tissue sarcoma of the extremity. This is the study schema. For smaller tumors less than 10 centimeters in size, the radiation dose in the experimental arm would be 25 grain, five fractions. For larger tumors, that would be 30 grain, five fractions. And in uh, both settings, the control arm would be 50 gray, 25 fractions. A lot of oncologists prefer the use of chemotherapy in these settings of larger tumors. And the study would allow for that in the form of Dr. Rubison ifosamide based chemotherapy. The radiation dose in that case would be slightly lower, uh, 28 gray in five fractions. Uh, here are the eligibility criteria in general. Uh, these are extremity soft tissue sarcomas that are higher grade uh, in adults and excluding other histologies, uh, bone origin, uh, any metastatic sites. Uh, pretty standard radiation planning details. Um, one unique aspect we would propose is, you know, in the spirit of hypofractionation to do a single fraction boost in the experimental arms. And we have a number of radiation dose constraints for five fraction. And um, in general, these are pretty conservative in um, radiation terminology um, compared to kind of other cooperative tr um, other trials. And here's a more specific schema. Surgery would occur six weeks following the end of radiation, whether uh, on the control arm or experimental arm. And when chemotherapy is given, that would mean that surgery would be at week 14 in both arms. Um, and there's a slight modification of the chemotherapy <clears throat> in order to allow for concurrent chemoradiation uh, in the control arm. That's the conventional arm. The primary endpoint would be non-inferior local failure. And that would be benchmarked off of the last uh, big prospective study done in the US, RTUG 0630. And this study would require 204 patients with a power of 85% and a one-sided alpha of 5%, allowing for a non-inferiority margin of 10%. Secondary endpoints, uh, some of these are very important as well. Quality of life and treatment satisfaction, um, I think is very important in this setting. Um, we generally prefer the use of the PROMESS scores because they are computer adaptive um, and in general have about half as many questionnaires, questions as other questionnaires such as uh, the Toronto uh, salvage uh, scoring system. Um, other secondary endpoints would be the wound, co wound complications, both uh, de as defined by prior prior trials, as well as CTCAE. And then other endpoints are, are pretty typical of what you might expect. This is the um, definition from the NCIC initial, that's the original trial of preoperative, postoperative radiation for sarcoma. Um, and in general, it's just requiring a second operation, um, a new um, hospitalization, or uh, dressing changes for longer than six weeks. The impact is standardization of short course radiation across multiple sites. Um, as I mentioned, it's all been done sort of single arm, single institution for the most part. Um, and the goal is to cut treatment time. Um, this enables oncologists to start surveillance earlier. And I'll note that in RTOG 0630, 6% of patients had progression prior to surgery. Uh, we could potentially reduce toxicity in that we would be given a lower dose of radiation for those smaller tumors. And uh, this could have pretty huge implications with regards to health disparities, uh, being able to more easily treat patients living in more rural areas. And I'll note that non-white patients tend to overrepresent those with fewer resources for travel as well as treatment coordination. Um, so that's it, and I'd be happy to answer questions um, or hear any comments. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so 
uh, I think this was this is really good forum for us to kind of look at these as you're kind of developing this concept. Um, any thoughts from the, the uh, anybody on the group, particularly the surgeons? Do do they see a role for short course uh, uh, radiation therapy, or do you do you do radiation therapy? I guess for your sarcomas, that's the other question. There is a question I think in the chat from Dr. Kraus. Um, are there any surgical oversight or mandates planned? At minimum, surgery data forms and path data forms are imperative. Yeah, I think that would be you know, really important in the development, for sure. It would also be really nice to do some type of central review since a lot, there's a lot of heterogeneity in these sarcomas at single institutions, especially those that don't see that, that many. But again, that's the goal of this study is, is you know, really unifying the ability to do short course radiation um, because now it'd be considered pretty experimental. And so um, even in, um, during the time of COVID where we're trying to make fewer um, uh, uh, patient experiences or patient um, encounters in, in the uh, hospital setting, um, people have been really reluctant to do, do things like short courses of radiation where it's not like rigorously tested in a, in a multi-institutional setting. Jeremy, where are you in terms of the, the development of the study? How far along has it come? Not very, not very far at all. It's super early. Um, and so that's why I'm very open to ideas, critiques, comments, um, whether it's about feasibility um, uh, or, or the science. Yeah, I think we can certainly continue to develop this uh, in conjunction with the sarcoma committee and the surgery committee. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I do see that um, there is a role for this, you know, to ask this trial to ask this question, and you know, um, um, let's let's keep pushing it forward. Jeremy, could I ask? I I definitely like the question. Um, we had a trial. Well, probably we still have a trial at Vanderbilt Open that this was That's the right. exact question. Have Have you run it by? Um, our, our colleagues over at Energy? Not yet. Uh, that's upcoming, I think, in a few weeks. Oh, so you're on the docket. That's right. Okay. So so maybe the docket I saw was you, and I hope, I very much hope so, because um, <laughs> I'm not sure if they're also spinning to do a trial. And if they are, that's okay. Let us know, because maybe we could collaborate. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. So our final speaker is our vice chair for the committee, Dr. Flavio Rocco, who's the chief of surgical oncology at OHSU. And he's going to be discussing a concept that is being developed through the GI committee, as well as the surgery committee, uh, SWAG 2109, a randomized phase two study of new adjuvant NEVO plus IPI versus surgery alone in patients with resectable HCC. And, um, Flavio is going to be wrapping up the session because I have to be at a different meeting at six o'clock. Right. No worries. Thank you, Sai. And uh, thank you all for, for uh, joining. And uh, I'm going to go through this concept. This is 2109. So this is uh, one we've been working with. And actually, I got to give a lot of credit to Dr. Ahmed Kaseb and uh, Anthony Okuri, uh, who have been really developing this concept. And as uh, much to Lisa's point at the beginning of the session, we really want to um, kind of get surgeons involved in these type of neoadjuvant adjuvant studies where I think we can make a contribution. And as you'll see, uh, we do need to get the buy-in uh, from, uh, from this group and, and others uh, around the uh, NCTN. So we're gonna advance the slide. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the, 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 you know, a lot of the background because we're running a little short on time, um, but just to give a sense of you know, uh, immunotherapy for uh, HCC, as you know, is kind of an exploding field right now. You know, for a long time, all we had was TKIs and serafinib. And now, as you all know, the standard of care for advanced disease is Atezo and Bev, and even nivolumab uh, and pembrolizumab are now making their way uh, into perhaps uh, uh, the resectable setting. And so the idea behind this trial was based on a previous uh, single institution study done at MD Anderson uh, by uh, Ahmed, uh, looking at neoadjuvant uh, this was a single point, single checkpoint versus dual checkpoint inhibition, NEVO and NEVO-IPI, 
where they actually saw a significant amount of uh, complete responders. Uh, it was a small trial, just a feasibility. Uh, and so this is the follow-up study to this. And because obviously these patients are, can be candidates for multiple therapies, including liver transplantation, ablation, other local regional therapy, we wanted to find a, a, a population that would be most suited for this type of study. And so these are the uh, general eligibility criteria. So again, must have a resectable HCC uh, per institutional standard. Again, it's really hard to mandate you know, what's resectable to one person versus the other. Uh, I do think you know, most places uh, will have a multidisciplinary discussion for these, uh, uh, for these patients. And so whatever that standard may be, uh, and so typically, I'll give you an example of what it is here at OHSU. For example, it's the sort of solitary lesion um, that's going to be outside of Milan criteria, so five centimeters or bigger. Uh, and on occasion, you can talk about a, a multifocal case uh, that's, again, not going to be eligible for transplant, uh, although that certainly is not standard of care. Uh, but the trial will, uh, uh, will take up to, you know, the multifocal disease of up to three lesions. Um, so again, not eligible for transplant because that's still considered uh, somewhat standard of care. Uh, child's PUA, certainly no vascular invasion, no ascites, no variceal bleeding, no portal hypertension, and no previous liver-directed therapy. So we want to get these patients off at the beginning. Next slide. Go ahead and click it again. I think it's got a graphic. Okay, there you go. So this is the way the trial is actually designed is that there's a, uh, there's a safety run-in. Again, because neoadjuvant therapy is not the standard of care, um, the, the, the initial cohort of patients, the 30 patients, uh, are going to get the checkpoint uh, therapy and then look at, look at and see if there's any signals for safety, uh, primarily failure to progress to surgery due to these SAEs, uh, and actually then do some of the initial pathologic response rate information, which is actually, I think, part of, you know, part of the exciting part of this trial is actually that correlative science to look at what that effect uh, may be. And then certainly if there's uh, no safety signals, then it'll proceed to phase two, which is the randomized portion of the trial. And so as long as uh, no more than 20% of patients fail, fail to achieve uh, therapy and, it, the path, and the pathological response rate is seen to be greater than 15%, we then move on to phase two, which is then the um, same population, but now being then randomized to two arms, uh, either the neoadjuvant uh, combination checkpoint therapy with nevo ipi followed by resection or surgical resection alone, which is the standard of care. I don't know if there's more to that slide. Okay, there we go, perfect. So here, yeah, go ahead and just click through that. I think there's a couple more things. There we go. Um, so the primary endpoint then for the study uh, is gonna be uh, a recurrence-free survival uh, with secondary endpoints being path response rate, overall response rate, OS, and then toxicity. Uh, there are built-in exploratory endpoints, uh, mainly uh, due to immune profiling, immunoscores, uh, to look at, again, what is the uh, effect of the checkpoint inhibition. Uh, if you look on the bottom right there, there's the statistics uh, justification for the study. So looking at how many patients will be needed. Uh, and so if we're looking at uh, a hazard ratio of 1.5 with a median RFS of 50 months for the experimental arm, it'll be 88 patients per arm or uh, um, 176 total with an estimate of 196 needing to be enrolled. Uh, so this is big, begs the question of feasibility, uh, which is you know, usually number one for these cases, especially when you have a, a challenging and rare uh, tumor. So this is where I think this group um, will be very important to try to uh, look at what, what can we uh, uh, bring together from our institutions. Uh, we know that HCC, you know, although most clinical trials are, are being held in the community, HCC is a little unique in the sense that most patients get referred to a transplant center. So it tends to be more of a tertiary care um, uh, situation. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so we've started to do, oh, sorry. So these are the arms just to give you a sense of the details. Um, so here's the, uh, the schema for the uh, neoadjuvant arm, looking at the preoperative induction phase of Nevo and IPI every two weeks uh, for six, uh, sorry, yeah, every two weeks uh, for Nevo and then every six weeks for the IPI at the, at week tw at the 12 week Week 12 mark is when surgery happens, and then you have the surveillance endpoint. Uh, Pre-treatment, you'll get the imaging and the, and the blood testing, um, as well as the core specimens. Uh, and that's another thing to keep in mind is that we are going to be requiring pre-operative tumor biopsies. Again, these are for the correlative studies. And uh, as this group knows, usually HCC is not is diagnosed radiographically. So this is something to keep in mind. 
The next, uh, next slide is then just the surgery, uh, the observation arm, which is again, the standard of care uh, surgery plus surveillance. Last slide, just because we're running out of time. So just to give the sense of what the surgical support is for this, and this is what I was getting to in my previous discussion, uh, is uh, Shisher was actually quite nice to have us uh, be able to present this at the ECOG meeting. We've obviously been discussing it at the, the SWOG GI committee, as well as our surgery group. And then uh, I am scheduled to discuss this at the Alliance group um, next month, and they have their fall meeting. Uh, more importantly, I really like to thank Mike, uh, D'Angelica, and Sai Ahmad, who are part of the HPBA leadership, uh, the Clinical Trials Committee and the Executive Committee. So they have reviewed the protocol. And just to give you a sense, the HPBA is the, uh, the, surgical, uh, the, the surgical association of, composed of surgical oncologists, pedibiliary surgeons, and transplant surgeons. So we have all relevant groups there. Uh, and they have generated a, a letter of support for this trial. Uh, we are now in the process of contacting several centers to get a sense of their numbers. And so I encourage you to please uh, shoot me an email if you're interested and if you have that information. For most places, if you can just contact your cancer registry, they'll be able to give you that data as far as resected patients. Uh, and that will help us get this through the um, NCTN. We are planning on submitting the capsule uh, pretty shortly. Well, that's all I had. We have three minutes uh, for discussion. If uh, anybody has any questions. Hey, hey Fah, this is Shisha. Do you mind just putting up the criteria for defining resectable HCC? Or do I have, how'd you define that? So it's, it's per institution. So that's, that's really, we want to really keep it relatively broad. Um, but, and so, that, which is why we included multifocal disease up to three lesions. But again, I think what I expect is most folks, which is what we do here, will probably be enrolling that solitary liver lesion in a non-portal hypertensive patient who's not a transplant candidate. Yeah. Which is a rare patient. <laughs> it's a rare patient. So for example, I'll give you a sense. So we looked at our data. We had about between 12 and 15 patients a year here at OHSU. Uh, I did get the data from Sai and Schimmel. Um, and uh, we have a, probably about 10 centers so far that have given us their cancer registry data. I got it. Yeah. So very similar in some sense to your gallbladder trials. <laughs> As far as yeah. the numbers go, yeah, absolutely. That's hard. I think that the variability and the um, institutional kind of leeway you're giving is going to be the key with this because this is such a heterogeneous disease. And you know, one satellite and large common hepatic RA lymph node, what do you do with that? Like, people are going to make their judgments, young patient, hep B, non cirrhotic, and you know, all those things are going to come into play. Yeah, and that was the whole point. I mean, we ideally would have loved to kind of stratify between, you know, Hep B, Hep C, as far as immunogenicity is concerned. Um, and perhaps, you know, again, if we get a better signal, we can actually expand that cohort. I mean, just like gallbladder cancer, if we were to run this in China, I'm yeah. sure we'd, we'd accrue in, you know, yeah. a couple months. Yeah. Uh, but there's obviously challenges to doing that. I mean, that phase two data from Ahmed and the Anderson is quite provocative. It's like <laughs> very, the CR, the path response rate was uh, extraordinary. Yeah, and, that, and that's the whole point. And I think, you know, that, that's the encouraging part from the feasibility, because if, you know, if MD Anderson was, was able to do that, you know, on their own in that amount of time, right. if we can gather, you know, I, I think, especially on this call uh, and, you know, with the colleagues uh, around the country, we can probably gather, uh, you know, a good cohort of centers that may have similar numbers. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending the meeting. Um, I don't know if Lisa has any parting words. Um, it's been a pleasure and thank you again to all the presenters and the attendees. And yeah, thanks Flavio personally. Thank you again for inviting me to present, I appreciate it. Thank you Flavio and Sai for another terrific meeting.